Attorney at Law, Stephen Skinner, joins us from the Skinner Law Firm. Stephen, good morning. How are you, sir? Good morning. Doing well. Hope you all are. We are. Great to have you with us. And periodically, we like to check in with you to find out how the opioid settlements and the updates on those are going. Do you have any new information for us on those? Well, I think that, you know, we're at this point, I've been working on this case, um, these cases for six years. And we're in terms of West Virginia, we're down to about the, the last significant defendant. And that's Kroger. We don't have a lot of Krogers in the Eastern Panhandle, but because um, we entered into an agreement with the rest of the local governments and the Attorney General, and by we I mean um, most of the local governments in the Eastern Panhandle, um, that means we have an interest in this case, which is going to go to trial later this spring. Um, so. You know, there is that that is pending. Um, essentially, there's about $900 million in uh, settlements to date that will flow into West Virginia, although none of the money has um, been allocated yet. That process is happening as we speak. There's a bank account with a couple hundred million dollars in it. And we'll, we'll see really over the rest of 2023, the court making some, some decisions about how that money is, is going to be spread around West Virginia. Now, what, what we agreed to um, is that we would take 25, approximately 25% of the money would be split up among the local governments according to a very specific formula and every county and every city um, for the most part is going to get a piece of that they're going to get that over a period of 10 to 12 years most of the rest of the money will go into a foundation i actually have a meeting about that foundation uh, in uh, a couple hours um, that's going to be focused on abatement in West Virginia. Abatement is solving the nuisance that was created. In this instance, it's trying to deal with opioid use disorder, substance use disorder in West Virginia. And that could be um, specifically targeted to regions that are um, particularly affected it looks at law enforcement, it looks at prevention, it looks at treatment. It's supposed to, the money's supposed to be invested in every single stage to try and um, help us get over or through, I should say, um, the epidemic which continues to rage today. So that's, we're gonna, we're gonna see a lot about that for the next decade. Um, you know, it has a tentative title, I think, the West Virginia First Foundation. And um, it, it, all of this should really sort of, we, sh we should see the final products of what's going to happen this year. And then the money will begin to flow. I know a lot of people are interested in how that money is going to be spent, um, particularly vendors. Um, and the counties and the cities are interested in it. This is, I'm talking about the foundation money. And um, that's something that's being formed right now. And the regions will be sending um, uh, each region, as the state's been divided up, will be sending a representative to the board of this foundation. So the Eastern Panhandle will have a, uh, someone on that board. Um, and there's a formula on spending that for the first seven years of the foundation requires a certain amount of money to be spent in each region. So we're, regardless of anything, we're going to see that money um, in part be spent as guaranteed in the Eastern Panhandle. Stephen, so, the, 
The representative to the foundation, do, does that have to be an elected official? Does it have to be somebody who's in the uh, drug treatment profession? Or is there any requirement at all? There, as of right this minute, there are no requirements for it. What we're working on right now is the process of how that person gets selected. Half of the board is going to be selected by um, the governor, appointed by the governor, and the other half are these regional representatives. It's supposed to basically be a check and balance on on the ability of one side to make decisions. And from my perspective, and one of the reasons why I was um, uh, in very involved in negotiating this over a year ago, was that we needed to make sure that all the money didn't get spent in and around Charleston and Huntington. Um, we, you know, we're, we we needed to have a check on that to make sure that we have money being spent back in the Eastern Panhandle. John Gilstrap. <clears throat> Could you give a, a quick pricey? You mentioned about the um, the – the defendant Kroger is is a pending pending defendant. Uh, what are the elements of the case? What are the, there's a lot of money flowing and all of that, and I I presume that there are uh, allegations against the the various pharmaceutical companies. But when you get to an individual company like Kroger, what is what is the alleged liability there? Well, the Kroger operated as a pharmacy, and the allegations against Kroger. Are, are, are generally about them not monitoring how the prescriptions were flowing out, that they didn't have the, the adequate checks on what was happening. There, if you look at the overall litigation, there are essentially three sets of defendants. There were the manufacturers of uh, the opioids, and most of us are very much acquainted with Purdue Pharma. Um, which, of course, went into bankruptcy as a result of this. And that company is being run essentially for the benefit of the victims of the uh, epidemic. So they're the manufacturers. Then there are the distributors. The distributors were actually much um, – uh, they're much larger than any of the manufacturers. And they represent the bulk of the settlement. They're the ones who had the most knowledge of what was going on, and they had alerts that they didn't do anything about in West Virginia. You know, it didn't. It didn't. Um, and, and Rob knows this well. The the uh, there are places in West Virginia that were getting millions of pills, even though the population of the town was something like 50 people. So it, it just didn't make sense. They were they were they knew that this was going on, and finally there are the pharmacies who were filling the prescriptions, who received the pills from the distributors, and we've uh, had significant um, settlements with um, Walgreens, with Walmart, with CVS, and Kroger is fairly significant presence in parts of the state. And that's why they're the um, one of the last. Kroger has settled um, in various states. I think they just had a ninety million dollars settlement in um, New Mexico. But um, we'll, we will see what happens. I think it's going slowly, and um, we're, our team is um, uh, focused on getting to the end, getting this money delivered back to our clients, the local governments of West Virginia and um, doing what they want, which is making sure that this mo money gets spent responsibly and also lifts some of the burden of the taxpayers for dealing with the problem. Is there a concern at all about a backlash with, I've had uh, several surgeries, one was an orthopedic surgery, and of course I got my, uh, the, the narcotic painkillers, and you always get more than, not talking about a million pills, but you know, you, you get 15, 20 pills and you use four or five of them. Uh, are we worried about a backlash where even that's not going to be possible? We're going to have folks with injuries, they need painkillers, and not going to be able to get them? I'll tell you what I'm worried about. I'm worried about all of this work and uh, and that we've been doing, and the doctors don't care. And I, I told Rob about this maybe six months ago. I had a minor procedure 
that I'd had before, and they handed me um, a month's worth of opioids on the way out, a prescription on the way out the door. I never asked for it. I never had it filled. I don't think that that the the uh, message is getting out there that uh, at least in parts of the U.S. that we need to um, deal with opioids in a different way. So, you know the the backlash. Um, you know, I, I don't see it happening, and you would think that it would be um, more difficult uh, to get an opioid prescription today, and I hope it is. But I certainly know that there are plenty of opioids being um, uh, manufactured and distributed um, as we speak. Is there anything in the the lawsuit or in the settlement money that uh, addresses Untying the knot that is addiction in in certainly in certain places within West Virginia where it's the the numbers of uh, is are are frightening. Um, how do you undo that? Is it, is the idea just to withdraw the the supply? Um, no, I think that and I think that this is what's exciting and certainly something the attorney general has um, been active in. Um, discussing is that the foundation is going to use evidence-based approaches to deal with the problem and cutting off supply is it isn't doesn't really solve the problem um you know one of our the, the way the epidemic has morphed right now is the um it, it was first somebody would be on pills and they would transition on the heroin well now the the transition or even the beginning of the problem is uh, synthetic opioids, which is what fentanyl is. And so we've got to deal the, the crisis right now, and certainly law enforcement can tell you about this. The crisis right now is fentanyl and where it's appearing and how strong it is. And um, in, in some ways it makes, you know, the relatively predictable heroin, seem uh, like a cakewalk. And right now, the synthetic opioids, um, we, don't, we don't even know what's going on. So with the manufacturer and how strong they are and how powerful they are, and um, the, the problem is dealing with the human part of it, which is we all of us know somebody who um, has had an addiction to opioids and men. Did we lose Stephen? I heard, I heard the, the, we, there you go. Your, hey, your last sentence disappeared, Stephen. So if you could repeat it, that'd be great. I'm sorry. And many of us know people or we know of people who have overdosed and we need to treat those people. And that's a part of what the foundation is going to do. It's going to look at the ways to treat people. But we're doing treatment right now, right? We, we do that. You can see the services being offered uh, in Berkeley County. You can see the services um, related to the Day Report Center um, and the leadership of Berkeley County Council. Um, we can see, whereas, you know, the hospital in Martinsburg didn't really have treatment for uh, opioid addiction in-house for a long time. Now those are coming online. So all of that's happening. At the same time, law enforcement has to do what it needs to do to cut off supply. We have to stop new addictions. We have to treat people who are addicted. That's what this money is going to do. You know, we, we've, Berkeley County is, is incredibly fortunate to have had the leadership that it has had um, over, the, over the last six years in how it, it's really the model county for West Virginia in how it, it deals with substance abuse. And um, we're fortunate that we've had the resources where they could do that. And now some of this money is going to go to, to even grow their ability to deal with it. Stephen, that's a great point, by the way. Doug Copenhaver uh, was at the forefront of this. And uh, obviously because of the losses Doug experienced in his family, uh, this was something he understood quickly that a lot of other elected leaders didn't. 
Stephen, and I think that's a big reason why Berkeley County has been so progressive and, and aggressive in their movements to move in this direction. Yeah, no, there's no question. I mean, Doug has had absolutely amazing vision for for doing what is right, and that's multifaceted in in what the the, the county's approach has been. And hopefully, we're going to see more of that um, across West Virginia when some of these other local governments, these other counties, who really have done have had no money to do anything, are going to have some money to do some of this. I mean, you've got to look at just what it, the counties pay for the court system primarily. They pay for the jail bills, you know, and somebody's got to pay for just that. And when you when you have to allocate money to deal with that, that means you can't do other things. So new money coming online is going to be barely significant um, across the state for different counties' abilities to do things, along with the foundation um, sort of being the, the clearinghouse for the best practices. John, you're about to ask. Yeah, when it comes to the pharmaceutical grade um, opioids, the OxyContin, the, that sort of thing, do we have a feel for a percentage of addictions that started, for lack of a better term, legitimately with with an injury that needed to be treated for pain and just kind of ran out of control as opposed to recreationally? And I, I know I'm getting these terms wrong. I don't want to anger anybody, but that's that's what comes to mind. You know, I think using those terms makes it more understandable. So those kind of figures, I I certainly couldn't tell you today. You know, the history of the epidemic has to do with um, legitimate prescriptions that then caused addiction. I mean, opioids were the are one of the most addictive substances that we can we can take and and it the the oxycontin the the theory from purdue pharma they marketed it as non-addictive because it was time release but and it was just it's one of the biggest lies that's ever been told today it's very difficult to um i, I have i have no idea what it is today because the nature of all of it has changed so significantly with fentanyl being so easily accessible in a way that, I mean, it is so much easier for fentanyl than heroin to be distributed because heroin has to be grown, has to be cultivated. And there, you really, it's really not done in the United States. Whereas, Fentanyl could be manufactured in a garage in Martinsburg. So um, the av availability, I think, has a lot to do with um, this, the beginning of addiction, like the access to it. So certainly there are a lot of people who still begin um, with, uh, with, with a legitimate prescription. Um, and that's one of the things that we hope has changed is that the pharmacies and the distributors are monitoring in such a way that the kind of explosive distribution through quote unquote legitimate uh, channels doesn't um, doesn't happen in the way that it did back in in the height of of the epidemic when you project out pick a number of years five years ten years fifteen years do you do you see this problem going away? Is, is there a way to, to stop it? Uh, that's, you know, we, we can, I can, we can only do what we can do. And we can hope that as the science of addiction becomes better known and our treatment methods become better known, that we come up with ways to uh, avoid it. Um, I'd like to think that, that we're up to meeting that challenge and um, that at some point this this money is going to make a difference. You know, we I, I'm I'm an optimist and I think that it is that it's going to save lives, period. Um, is it going to solve the problem? If you look at the history of opioids for over the last 300 years, we've always had opioid addiction, um, but we 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 have to get it under control. Now, Stephen, I want to get it. A 
question before you need to go, and this has to do with, uh, and you do it, you deal with personal injury law, and obviously when you deal with that law, oftentimes if the breadwinner of a family's income is uh, is affected or maybe there, there is a death involved through negligence, when you determine the settlement amount, replacing that income for a period of time uh, is oftentimes or at least some of the times part of the settlement amount. In these situations, this is money that's community-based. Are there individual lawsuits that are out there that factor into uh, individual overdose deaths and the income of that breadwinner being replaced in some way with a settlement? Well, so individual lawsuits for uh, are, are very challenging. And there are some. There are not many. Um, really, we in adjacent to what I've, I've been working on are what we call the NAS cases. Those are the children who are born with addiction, and they are born with addiction because of their parents. The, their, the, the mother was addicted at the time of birth. Th- those cases are moving along and are likely to have some significant, um, I would think, some significant compensation. Other cases are highly individualized. Because we have to imagine that the end point is presenting this to a jury. And you have to convince a jury that addiction uh, in the one person who's probably done a lot of really bad things um, before they died um, is, is going to deserve compensation. There are not a lot of those cases. It takes very... Um, a very specialized look into the facts in each case. If you did have that case, Rob, you would see um, that they, they would be asking for compensation. Um, but they're, they're not going to be a whole lot of those cases in the United States. Interesting. Uh, Stephen, any final thoughts on the, in regards to the Kroger lawsuit? And, and by the way, you said it's going to go to trial soon. Do you anticipate it being settled before the trial, or do you think it'll go through the trial phase? Well, so far, um, we've had one case go to trial, and a judge basically dismissed that. And all the rest of those, all the rest of the cases have settled. Um, we think the one that went to trial and, and we, the, that was effectively lost, that was Cattle Huntington, we think that that was an anomaly. So the likelihood of a settlement with Kroger, I, I, you never, you never like to to say it'll settle. But you know, if you look at the nature of what's happened across the U.S., most of these cases have settled. So very good. Thank we'll you, sir. We'll take it all the way if we need to. Your knowledge of this and ability to explain it is extraordinary, and I appreciate it every time you come on. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Stephen, how do people get in touch with you if any questions for you in regards to what we discussed today or anything else in, in terms of what your law firm represents? You can give us a call at 725-7029 or go to skinnerfirm.com. Thank you, sir. Have a great day.